first, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate Cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. And automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology. Real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Hi there, thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley. Funnily enough, it's uh, the same name I had last week. And this is the six, uh, 366th episode of Space Nuts, believe it or not. Coming up uh, this week, uh, we're going to look at an asteroid impact crater that may be the biggest one ever to be discovered on Earth, and it is uh, just down the road from where I am. In fact, I might be on the edge of it. Who knows? Uh, we'll also be looking at the mud cracks of Mars, and we'll be answering audience questions about Fred's spectrometer, uh, and Jared and Carlos are asking questions about sunlight and light in general, so we put them together to see if we can sort it all out for them. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me as he does, even though he can't avoid it, uh, is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Hi, Fred. Andrew. Uh, another episode. Uh, yes. With all those, they're going. Thick and fast at the moment. With all those questions on light, this is bound to be a, an illuminating ep episode. Oh, gosh, the dead yeah, jokes. Stars keep yeah. on coming. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, there's no, never a dull moment. <laughs> That's right. Don't start me. No, I won't. No, no, I won't. <laughs> uh, I used to play a game with a guy at the ABC once where, where we, we'd do that. We'd talk about something and we just kept coming up with puns. <laughs> and it'd just roll on and on and on. It, Gee, it was fun. But, I wish we'd done it on air. Oh, you didn't do we it. Used to, no, we did it at production meetings. Oh, uh, right. But we just, yeah, it'd just go on and on and on. We'd just keep coming up with them uh, one after the other, just firing them back. Great when you've got one's a skill. Real skill is that. Um, um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> That's not what the other people <laughs> sold. <laughs> Man. Oh, dear. Uh, now, um, we should get down to business, and this first story caught my eye over the weekend, and I thought we really need to talk about this because we have talked about in impact craters in the past, and of course there are a couple of famous ones, the Chicxulub Crater in what is now the Gulf of Mexico that they've been looking into, and they've found the, the impact point where the rebound happened, and they've taken samples and found some interesting stuff. Uh, there was also a story some time ago about a big one that they think was, I think was in China, somewhere there that was was hidden because, you know, the earth changes over time and these things disappear. And that's why we can't find a lot of them. But now they're saying this is possibly the biggest one ever. And it's uh, around the southern parts of New South Wales, the state where we live. Uh, it's called the Den uh, Deniloquin Impact Crater. Uh, Denil Deniloquin being a, a town in southern uh, inland New South Wales that I visited not so long ago. Yeah. So I've probably driven over this. You thing. might have done, that, yes. That explains the, the bumpiness of the trip. <laughs> not uh, New South Wales roads or anything like that. No. Oh, that's probably more <laughs> accurate. Yeah, it's lovely to see Daniloquin on the map, isn't it, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, the, the, the kinds of things that we talk about. Daniloquin, it, it's... It's really only famous for uh, the um, uh, the yearly get together of all the rev heads. The, um, uh, the what's it called? The Denny, uh, the Denny Must. Denny Bush. Is it the Denny Must? Denny Bush. Yeah, yeah. They get all their V eights and their Utes together and have a big weekend of rev heading it. Yeah, uh, but um, it, it's a beautiful little town though. Pretty well on the border, isn't it? If I remember rightly, or... it's down there, around about the you know, around the Griffith yes. um, Murray. Uh, the the um, uh, Murrumbidgee Irrigation Area okay. Zone, yeah, down there where they grow all the rice and all that other stuff. Quite so. Mm. So um, it's work that, uh, again, not only does this have an Australian flavour in that that's what we're talking about, uh, it's also research that's been done in uh, Australia, in fact, at the University of New South Wales, which I'm honoured to have um, an adjunct appointment at. 
uh, but not in geophysics. Um, so the the research that we're talking about uh, was published in a journal that I've never heard of, even oh. though I ought to have done with a name like that. It's called Tectonophysics. Um, wow. I mean, it, I guess it, which is a sub branch of geophysics. I guess where I tend to think of geophysics as the science of the Earth. Uh, but tectonophysics is even more specific. It's the science of kind of tectonic activity and things of that sort. Uh, yeah. So uh, it was, um, uh, t t it's actually two um, scientists who have led this work, Tony Yates and Andrew, uh, I can't see that, Glickson, that's what it is. It's his name. Oh, I thought it was Dunkley. Names. Never mind. Well, it could have been. It, uh, the, the, he, the, Andrew Dunkley might be the sleeping partner in the uh, in the trio. <laughs> The silent partner twice removed, probably. Yeah. But uh, these two scientists, uh, University of New South Wales, have uh, have basically had a notion for a long time that there was something going on in the ma magnetic field of the area around Deniliquin. <laughs> it's hard to say, isn't it? Yeah. Say it 10 times fast. Deniliquin, Deniliquin, Deniliquin. Yeah, De that is a lot easier. Uh, Everyone says, yeah, it's it, a lot of Australian towns, they just um, yeah. stoop to that level of giving it a, a shortened name. What's what's another one? Um, Gundawindi. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, al although you're supposed to pronounce it Gundawindi, but half the people say Gundawindi because it's spelled G-O-O-N, but people just call it Gundy. Yeah, Kuna, where um, I used yeah, to. Kuna, Kuna Barabra. Right. Yeah, and Dubbo um, is Dubbo. <laughs> <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Although people have started calling it Dub Vegas, I don't know why, but it's it's become a thing around town. I have to say, um, and we're, we're way off track now. My very first yeah, visit are. to Australia in 1978 uh, was to use the Anglo-Australian telescope. And so my travel was fixed up by um, colleagues at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. Uh, and of course, they're Scottish. And they told me that I would have to fly via Dubbo. Uh, Dubbo. Dubbo. <laughs> yes. So I thought, oh, Dubbo sounds good. <laughs> So yeah, not not quite how it's pronounced. Anyway, and you know what you you know what you need a lot of out here. Uh, I, no, I'm not falling for that. <laughs> going to use an, I'm going to use another um, abbreviation. Aircon. Yes, that's right. You do need a lot of aircon. Need a lot of aircon, yeah. indeed. So back to what the we talking back about? to the deniliquin structure. To yes, get it's well uh, Which uh, the 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 work that has been done, and this. Uh, I guess the caveat is that this has not been caught, confirmed by drilling, which is the gold standard in working out whether you've yeah. got an impact crater. Because if you drill, you can find shocked quartz and all these sorts of things that um, that that look uh, that tell you basically what what's been happening. Uh, that there have, has been a high energy process of some sort, and the highest energies come from impacts. So the uh, idea it, and comes from, uh, so I was just uh, basically saying, it's the, uh, and it, this is all uh, kind of nearly nearly 30 years ago that Tony Yates suggested this, magnetic patterns mm. beneath the Murray Basin, uh, that r great river system in New South Wales, may suggest that there is a huge uh, buried impact structure. And um, I think a survey was done of the, you know, the related geophysical data uh, between 2015 and 2020 uh, seemed to confirm the existence of a 520 kilometer diameter structure. Uh, this is an extraordinary size. Um, it's massive. Compared with uh, Chicxulub, the dinosaur, you know, dinosaur killing impact crater. 170 kilometers wide, uh, much mm. much uh, smaller, and I think the um, I think the one that's usually considered the world's largest is 300 kilometers wide. It's in South Africa, and it's the uh, Fredefort uh, impact structure, which I think would be a uh, an Afrikaans name, uh, uh, and I think that's I don't, I'm not sure whereabouts it is, but it is in in South Africa, uh, which in some ways a similar you know, similar geology to what we have—a kind of ancient landscape. Um, yes, the it's the kinds of things that lead to the suggestion that there's that the magnetic information gives you leads this, to the suggestion that you've got a crater there. 
is that the, the magnetic field lines, the local magnetic field lines, form a ring pattern, um, mm. which is centered uh, sort of in the Deniliquin district. Uh, and But there are also um, what are known as radial faults. So um, these, basically these uh, fault lines in the landscape caused by tectonic movement uh, are essentially in a radial direction. And I guess they're perpendicular to the you know, the, the ring structure of the magnetic field. Uh, but the other thing that's um, basically being um, held up as, a, as really strong evidence for it being an impact crater is the central structure. Uh, the, there is a central core which has kind of high density. And um, you and I have talked about this before. In fact, I think you mentioned it a few minutes ago, that when you get an impact, not only do you get a crater falling, but there is a central peak as well, which often yeah. often disappears uh, because an impact of big enough size, certainly like the 15-kilometer uh, object that hit uh, the Chicxulub area in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, that one, the, the, the energies are so much that the rock uh, surface basically turns into liquid. It, it behaves just like a liquid. So you get this huge deep crater formed and then a rebound in the center uh, and then that collapses as well. Um, and it's mm. all in a matter of minutes, actually, the, you know, kind of 500 seconds or something, and it's all over. Uh, yes. It's extraordinary. So that, uh, there is evidence for uh, this um, this central structure, as well as the what are called being called anom uh, magnetic anomalies, the, the the things that give you the radial patterns and the um, and the and the, uh, the, the the circular patterns as well. So mm. um, that's the current theory, uh, and it's uh, I guess it's hard to date it without samples. Uh, I was about to ask you how long ago this might have happened, but yeah, I guess because it's just a theory based on. Was it magnetic data? Um, hard to uh, hard to really pinpoint. It is, although the these authors and I should mention that this is very nicely written up in the conversation uh, for anyone who wants to look at it. These um, actually, I've just gone to the wrong conversation article there, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's worth it's worth tracking down. the The title is uh, "New Evidence Suggests the World's Largest Known Asteroid Impact Structure Is Buried Deep in Southeast Australia." So, yeah. um, so. There is, I think, there is reason to believe that this um, event may have taken place in the region of half a billion years ago, uh, right. and the that links it to something already known, uh, which is a mass extinction, uh, which occurred somewhere between four hundred fifty-five point two and four hundred forty-three point eight million years ago. So that kind of nearly half a billion. It's got a name, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, and I'm not a geophysicist, so I'm not mispronouncing this. Uh, the Hanantian glaciation stage, uh, and it's sometimes defined as the Ordovician Silurian extinction event, where something like 85% of the planet species were eliminated, um, partly by uh, a glaciation. You know, it was a, basically a, an ice age, a gigantic ice age lasting for millions of years. Or, or mm. um, yeah, in fact, millions of years, something like a, a million and a half years, uh, that uh, that would double, sorry, that would um, that would essentially um, wipe out more than twice the number of species that the the, the Chicxulub impact crater did. Um, that, yeah. What what kind of life are we talking about? Well, then? it would be primitive life, wouldn't it? You, you're talking about uh, that's a really good question, uh, and. Um, I did a table for uh, the book uh, Spacewalk that essentially mentioned what uh, you know what time in the past different sorts of life came into being, and I think we were mm. talking really about plant life here, uh, mostly. Uh, there, there's um, th there's a number of extinction events that took place around that time. Something called uh, uh, the um, the early Cambrian extinction event, which was uh, a bit more than uh, half a billion years ago. We're talking about a very primitive structure uh, or very primitive living organisms on our planet's surface. Really extraordinary stuff. I should um, try and check, uh, you know, 
excuse me, I'll go back to Space War. Uh, I don't carry the whole book in my head, so I need to check the actual dates of when different species came into being. But um, I'll have a chance to do that and report back next week, Andrew. Yeah. Just as a matter of interest, we're talking about a, a potential impact site of 560 kilometres, was it? Yeah, 520, I think, was the... 520. What? How big a rock would create that? Yeah, well, we think that the 170 kilometre uh, crater, uh, the Chicxulub crater, was was caused by something maybe 15 kilometres across. This is going to be bigger. Uh, yeah. uh I don't know how much bigger, but you're certainly talking about an object in the tens of kilometres range, and that is a species-destroying impact. It doesn't sound big, does it, when you think, you know, how big the Earth is, uh, 12,500 kilometres in diameter, and yet something yeah. that's only 15, 20, maybe 30 kilometres across can so disturb the atmosphere that you lose... Half the living organisms on the well, yeah, just yeah, mind-boggling stuff. I suppose it's um, it's coming in. It's such That's a trade. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the, the yeah the the impact is just yeah. You know, this is the thing that's coming in at uh, what thousands of kilometers an hour. And, yes, certainly. It, I've, I've and it just suddenly stops. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it's the surface, which is why the surface effectively behaves like a liquid because the amount of energy yeah. that comes from that explosion, um, typically thirty kilometers per second, something like that. So yeah. You know, it's pretty pretty fast, <laughs> and and it would have hit the planet at a time where uh, the land masses would have looked so. Yes, different. that's right. So it, it wouldn't have been Australia back then. It would have been, I think, it was um, a, a, one of those supercontinents. Um, possibly Gondwana. Uh, I think yeah. Gondwana was the big one, um, mm. and um, the thinking is that it was in the sort of northern part of Gondwana that this impact would have taken place. That's where Australia was yeah. at the time. Well, I suppose what happens next, we assume, is that somebody gets their um, uh, ry uh, Ryobi drill and starts <laughs> digging down there to um, to try and uh, find some yeah, evidence. Yeah, and I've actually got spare Ryobi batteries if anybody needs, you know. <laughs> I've got one of those yeah. too. <laughs> yes. But you need to get one of those really big drill bits, like that really, you know, about an inch thick. But I think it's a bit even long. a bit thicker than that. Yeah, but but well, what an interesting experiment to do, and I don't think it'll be long before we start seeing uh, talk of expeditions mounted to take those core samples and and find the smoking yeah, gun. Probably a lot easier than jigsaw lab. Yes, it, that's right. You'd think so. Mm. Uh, although I yeah. guess it's possible that the the main mass might be buried deeper than jigsaw lab because it came in at a high velocity. Yes, indeed. All right. We watch with interest. There's uh, quite a few articles about this online, uh, the conversation. Uh, there's also a really good one on the Australian Geographic website if you want to mm. check it out. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor, uh, Professor, Professor, Professor Fred Watson. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. And automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology. Real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Put my teeth back in. That's the old radio saying, isn't it? Uh, now, from asteroids uh, hitting Earth to water on Mars, which has been a, a regular topic of ours in recent times, but uh, we're starting to continually find evidence of the activities uh, that happened on Mars in its deep, dark past. Uh, obviously, river deltas and uh, previous ocean sites and now we're finding mud cracks, uh, courtesy of uh, Curiosity. That's right. It? Yes. So this is uh, so you, you're absolutely right. Perseverance is investigating what is an ancient river delta, uh, a Jezero crater. While Curiosity uh, plodding away since was it 2012 when Curiosity landed? I think. Uh, yeah, sounds about yeah, right. Um, has been investigating Gale Crater, uh, not that far from Perseverance on a global scale, but too far for the for them to meet and shake hands 
a gale crater, once again, uh, an impact crater, but one that was thought to have once harbored a lake. Um, there's some evidence that Gale Crater was once wet. Uh, but what we're now finding is evidence that uh, not only was it wet, but there were wet and dry cycles. And that comes from actually imagery uh, of uh, Curiosity from uh, some of their cameras, uh, which uh, is at a part of uh, Gale Crater where there is a large flat rock named Pontours or Pontour. I'm not sure whether it's French or anyway, P-O-N-T-O-U-R-S. Uh, even though actually this, uh, it may be French because this, this research has been carried out by a team led uh, at the University of Toulouse in France. So, um, month, you know, an image of a, of a patch of rock uh, is not the sort of thing that you imagine would give you a really good clue about this sort of activity. But uh, the imagery is easy to find on the web. Um, this rock shows hexagonal patterns on it, which are a matter of just a few centimetres, four centimetres or so across. So these are quite small. Uh, they've yeah. been observed by, I think, the mast cam on Curiosity. Um, yeah, Curiosity's mast cam, a camera that's been looking at the ground in front of it. Uh, what's interesting is their regularity. So these cracks are not just sort of straight lines in the mud. They're these, this whole pattern of, of hexagons, uh, as I said, four or five centimetres across, looking uh, a lot like a patch of crazy paving. Crazy paving was very popular uh, where I grew up in the sort of 40s and 50s, I think. Um, um, you got lots of slabs of rock, which are different shapes, and you put them down uh, in a way that, uh, you know, that, that actually made sense, but it didn't have any symmetry to it. These like a, like a jigsaw, uh, like a, like a kind of, yes, a, a rather rugged jigsaw puzzle. Uh, but these yeah. ones do, they're all six sided. And mm. um, the really interesting comment from, uh, actually, this is Sky and Telescope, uh, their article on this uh, by Colin Stewart. Uh, the comment uh, is that when, when mud dries out, uh, it, it shrinks and it fractures into T-shaped junctions. But if you get repeated wetting and drying, uh, that apparently softens the junctions and these junctions become Y-shaped. And a Y-shaped junction is the basically the origin of mm. hexagonal cracks. Uh, very, very distinctive pattern. And it is, you know, when you look at the pictures, you can see it there. It's extremely regular. Um, as I said, like crazy paving, but very, very well ordered crazy paving, uh, yeah. because uh, these hexagons are quite marked. Um, so that's the that's the evidence. I think think might have had a question there, Andrew. Did you? Did I interrupt you? Oh uh, no! It just it reminds me a little, and I don't know if it's related anyway. But it reminds me of uh, tessellated rocks, in which we have. Yes, heard. yes, that's right. It's a sort of co um, there's a there's a famous outcrop of them in Tasmania, the tessellated pavement. I think they yeah. call it. Yeah, uh, they have a different origin. Um, I figured they might because yes. they're a different shape. They're um, they're definitely igneous. They're they're rock that's effectively bul volcanic, and of course you also get columnar basalt. Uh, tessellated rocks are basically the tops of columns of of mm. uh, of these hexagonal columns. Um, have you been to Sawn Rocks near Narrabri, Andrew? Which is one of the I... finest. No, I don't think I've been to that one. I have been to the one in Tassie. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know where you mean. I've been there too. But the, 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 these are Solomon rocks are actually the basalt columns there. Uh, uh, but some of them have fallen down. And when you look at the end, you, you, what you've got there is a tessellated pavement, a tessellated rock. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. These do look like that. Uh, but they have a different origin. These, this is definitely sedimentary rock rather than igneous rock. And so these are this was mud at one time. And so okay. the... The, um, the 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 interesting thing is that things like this, uh, certainly in in rock uh, geologically, uh, are pretty rare on Earth because they you know they get eroded away and also we get um, we get the effects of subduction that spoils a lot of 
uh, the ancient landscape of the earth. It means it's under a rock somewhere else that we can't see or probably in the mantle and probably much more fluid. Uh, whereas uh, the, uh, the the ones on Mars are preserved. And uh, just to kind of cut to the chase on this, the, um, the cracks can be dated because uh, there is apparently a salty crust on their edges, uh, which is known to have arisen something like 3.8 uh, to 3.6 billion years ago. Now, that's the period, exactly the period when we think Mars was kind of drying out, that before that it was it was more more wet. Um, it's a period we call the Noatian Hesperian transition, when you went from a wet Mars to a dry Mars. And that's the time you would expect to find uh, this sort of pattern of wet and dry, maybe, you know, every day. That's the the thing. Um, and so um, one of the authors of this paper, there's some lovely quotes here, which I'm just going to read out. This is the first tangible evidence we've seen that the ancient climate of Mars had such regular Earth-like wet dry cycles. Um, and so it probably to do with Gale Crater either being flooded or just uh, the groundwater sort of coming upwards just through through cracks or through through um, uh you know the basically the sorts of things like the uh, the like the the ge- geothermal wells that we've got in north northern New South Wales where we're just talking about the impact. Uh, mm. So um, and he, the, um, the this author goes on uh, to say that we know that wet dry wet dry cycles. This is the interesting bit, uh, Andrew. Wet dry cycles can drive chemical reactions to obtain the building blocks of life. Now, this is actually another uh, author. Uh, in fact, it's, it's actually somebody, this is Sidney Becker, who's at uh, Max Planck Institute of Molecular Physiology in Germany, not involved with this research. Uh, but that's a natural, you know, a natural uh, consequence of these wet-dry cycles. So uh, as Sidney Becker goes on, finding these conditions on Mars is an exciting discovery. And I should attribute the uh, comments from the University of Toulouse author of this, uh, William Rapin, or Rapin, uh, who uh, has made those comments about the the, the, the wet dry cycles um, and the fact that we we don't you know we we see these Earth like phenomena on the planet Mars. Uh, I think that's very exciting. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, you know it, it. Although we we shouldn't be surprised that we're finding. Uh, formations like this on other planets and, and and other satellites, moons, and things, because um, I don't know if it's mathematics or 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 what, but uh, if the conditions are right, it's going to follow a certain pattern regardless of where it's happening. Yeah, that's Am that's right. right. The, the trouble is, we 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 really don't know what actually triggers uh, living organisms, um, and, mm. and in fact. Um, Dr. Becker, who we were just talking about, Sidney Becker from uh, the Max Planck Institute in Germany, uh, comments that um, it's not just this wet-dry cycling that you need to put together the building blocks of life. Uh, you would need the right atmospheric composition, uh, composition, the right mineral compositions, and we don't know whether Mars had those, partly because we don't know what, you know, what the chemistry exactly is. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, Dr. Becker says the conditions needed for the origin of life might be different to the ones that actually create the needed building blocks. In other words, you might still get these um, you, you get these building blocks of life being formed chemically, but the, the, there might be other conditions that you just don't have that would be what would trigger trigger life. Um, mm. it's, yeah. Sorry. Go go ahead, Andrew. No, I was just going to say um, I was probably alluding more to the, um, the, the the way the rocks shape themselves and the, yeah. the way that the sediments fall. Yes, and, and yes. Yeah, well, that's true as well. Certain that, that, that is true. That's correct. That's mm. that's physics rather than uh, biochemistry. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> uh, and just to wrap up his comments, the conditions to sustain life over a long period over a long period of time, again, could be very different since the first life was likely very fragile. Wet dry cycling might have caused too much external disturbance, uh, you know. So we, we, we really we we just don't know. Uh, and uh, once again, this is in that basket of many many 
pieces of evidence that we've got that Mars was once wet and may have had exactly the right conditions or the same conditions that we had on Earth, which did uh, generate life. Maybe, maybe it did on Mars, but we don't know. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure, well, I'm hopeful we'll figure it out. And we were talking about it last week with the samples that yeah. Perseverance has been collecting and uh, will be picked up one day and analysed. And you never know, the answer might be in one of those big cubes. could be, cubes. exactly. Very possible. Uh, but yes, uh, skyandtelescope.org um, is the place where you can read the article about that discovery of the mud tracks on Mars. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, uh, let's um, turn it over to the audience and see if we can solve some of the puzzles that riddle them. And the first one comes from Rusty. Hello, Fred and Andrew. It's Rusty. Hello from Donnybrook. A question for Fred. Fred, uh, you built the world's first multi-object spectrometer. I think I'm getting it right. And uh, that really makes you the inventor. So um, what has the science enabled in the field of astronomy uh, so far? And where do you see it leading in the foreseeable future? This is really interesting. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Rusty. Uh, tell us about the spectrometer, Fred. Yeah, it actually wasn't the world's first multi-object spectrometer. Uh, it was um, the world's first wide field uh, multi-object spectrograph. We used optical fibers uh, right. to, to take the light from the UK Schmidt telescope, which has a huge field of view, six degrees on the side. Uh, and so we could put fibers on selected targets in that field of view uh, and take them to a spectrograph which sat outside the telescope. It was also the, the world's first to use an off-telescope spectrograph. That's the instrument that records the spectra. The rainbow spectra in which are embedded all the signatures of the elements and the molecules and the velocities and everything that you want to know about. So yeah. uh, what we did, and it, it was... Uh, actually, there's a nice link here, Andrew. Um, I worked very closely with a man called Dr. John Doerr, uh, who was actually um, my first boss in Australia. He was, uh, like me, um, a scientist at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, but uh, on secondment to Australia. Strangely, uh, at the end of his life, I was his boss. Um, because um, we worked together on a project, uh, a different project. He sadly lost his battle with cancer in, I think, about 2004. Uh, John's, uh, John's life, the last years of his life, were in, guess where? Deniliquin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. so, so John and I um, worked on the idea. What a, what a hole that place is. <laughs> I think he really liked it. He moved from Coonabarabran like via Coonamble to Deniliquin. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. his daughter still lives there, uh, one of his daughters. So um, John was a very fine scientist, very active mind. We worked together on the idea that this telescope, the Schmidt Telescope, the United Kingdom Schmidt Telescope, which, by the way, is 50 years old this uh, tomorrow. It's 50 years old tomorrow. Oh, no, really? The 17th wow. of August, 1973, was when it was commissioned and opened. Uh, it was built as a wide-angle photographic telescope. In other words, a wide-angle camera. That was what it was built to do, to photograph the southern sky on 365-millimeter uh, square plates. That's 14 inches in the old measure. They were yeah. millimeter thick, so they were quite flexible, which they needed to be because the focus of the telescope was curved. And for the first uh, 20 years of its life, uh, that's what the telescope did. Um, but uh, when I arrived there in 1982, the telescope had been working for nine years by then, uh, John and I could see another future for the telescope, which was to use this new trick of optical fibers, not invented in Australia, but definitely perfected here, both on the Anglo-Australian mm -hmm. Telescope and the UK Schmidt, uh, to, to record uh, uh, the light of objects spread over a very wide field of view. 
that was the new thing that we did and uh, wrote papers about that, uh, suggesting that this would be a way to do what we call spectroscopic surveys. That's to say that for each object, you take a spectrum and get all these intimate details about its rotation, its speed, its chemistry, and all that. Uh, to do that yeah. for many objects simultaneously and to do it over the whole sky. If you've got a wide field telescope, then you can cover the whole sky in a relatively short time. And uh, that the, it's exactly what we did. Uh, by the early 2000s, we were engaged in something called the 60F Galaxy Survey, which surveyed galaxies over the whole sky, about 136,000 of them. And then we did half a million stars over the whole southern sky uh, with the RAVE survey. Uh, that so just going to the last bit of Rusty's question there, uh, that way too from you. Yeah. That, that uh, work, and I'm not claiming any great priority here, but um, it did really lay the groundwork for what is happening today, which are instruments that uh, are, you know they take that what we call the multiplex advantage, the fact that you can look at many objects at once. They take that to a completely new level. Um, the best we did on the Schmidt telescope was to have 150 fibers. Uh, each one could be put on a on a target object. So you could get, actually you had to put some of them on the sky as well to record the background, but you could get something like 130, 140 different objects in one hit. And you might do, um, on a good night, you might do seven or eight of those. So you, you're pulling in large numbers of, of targets. But now um, the organization that we both work for, the former uh, Australian Astronomical Observatory, which is now um, called Astralis, at least its instrument building uh, section is, they just finished a device which is going out to a telescope in Chile, uh, which has uh, 2,400 fibers. So, you oh. know, um, nearly 20 times the number that we were dealing with. So you can, and that's on a bigger telescope, you can go fainter, see more objects. So basically, uh, what where this is all leading to, Rusty, is to uh, have a spectrum for every object in the sky uh, down to a really faint level. So it's a, uh, a the survey astronomy has been transformed by this fiber optic technique and has brought many discoveries uh, in terms of our own galaxy uh, and the wider universe and cosmology. It's the way it's by using this technique that we've learned about the some of the aspects of the universe. We've confirmed dark energy, confirmed dark matter uh, by looking at the way galaxies behave. So um, fantastic. Yeah, I don't often get the opportunity to say all that, but I'm, I'm sort of quietly proud of what we did uh, back in those days. We really laid the groundwork for what became a huge science. Yeah. See, Rusty, it was worth the 20 bucks he slipped up. <laughs> I've only got 10 of it, actually. I don't know where the rest's gone. <laughs> probably commi he was commissioned from Hugh, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> yes, very true. All right. Uh, thank you, Rusty. Uh, astute as always. Uh, now we're going to focus our attention on sunlight, light in general, other stars. Uh, we've got a couple of questions about that. This first one comes from Carlos. Hello, Space Nuts. It's Carlos from Austin, Texas. It's pretty hot here, so... I have a couple of questions about the sun, more general star, like a stars. Um, so how does a star turn on? Would it, what would the ignition look like? Is it like a log burning on and off in different areas? Is it more like a gas grill? Uh, and you, you put a lighter to it and it's all on at once. Would it be more like a motor engine, you know, something like And then Second question is, I know it takes thousands of years for photons to escape the center of the sun. Um, is this also the case of startup? Essentially, will the sun or will this star be on but not showing for a few thousand years? Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, keep up with the great work. Thanks. Thank you, Carlos. I, I, that's a good question. <laughs> yes. um, I, I, I've never really thought about how a star sort of gets going um you know is it like a, a, a log fire that sort of slowly erupts into the inferno that keeps you warm or is it just boom or yeah i mean they they do begin in gas clouds don't they yeah. these massive clouds and, and and there's a lot of um uh pressure brought to bear i think isn't it to uh, to create the process um uh, depending on what's in there uh yeah you, 
You tell me, Fred. I have no. no, you, no what, you, what... You're absolutely right, Andrew. So oh, I've okay. got um, uh, a, cow, a cloud of gas and dust, uh, which collapses under its own gravity. Uh, in fact, it, it might collapse in little pockets in different places. So that's why we think stars are born in clusters. And we, we mm -hmm. can see these. Uh, the, the James Webb Telescope is great at penetrating these uh, clouds of gas and dust where we can see the stars, actually, the newborn stars uh, in the middle of them. So, um, But that process, is it, it is a gravitational collapse. So it's not sudden. And I, I think we've been asked before, how long does it take for this to switch on? Um, I suspect it's still, you know, a, a relatively leisurely period as the uh, as the star collapses. What you're going to get is at the very centre where the pressure is highest, the temperature goes up highest. Uh, that's where the hydrogen fusion will kick off. Uh, and that's what kind of starts star, uh, the star burning. Uh, and I think that will spread uh, as the collapse continues. That will basically spread. There'll be radiative heating from uh, the, the central nucleus, which will heat up the hydrogen around it. Uh, so I think it'll be a process that it, it, it's actually the, the idea of a log burning is probably not too far off the mark, except I think it will be okay. more symmetrical than a log. I think it's, it's yeah. going to have you know a spherical symmetry um, and might take quite a long time. And then the newborn star goes through all kinds of phases where it's actually emitting, uh, it's sort of spewing off gas uh, because, uh, you know, the sort of surplus gas that it doesn't need that gets blown away. Uh, so you get these stellar winds and things of that sort. It goes through something called a T-Tauri phase where it's uh, emitting uh, uh, light from directly from, from glowing hydrogen rather than from uh, a hot body, which is what the star eventually uh, does. It's got a different sort of spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the, the, I, I like uh, the second part of Carlos's question as well. That you know, it does. Uh, we know. I think it's about one hundred and seventy thousand years is the uh, best estimate for how long it takes light to get from the central nucleus of the sun out to the photosphere where we actually see it. Uh, in yeah. in which time it's bouncing off atoms all the way up, so that they start off as gamma rays and wind up as uh, they've lost energy on the way out, but they come out as visible light. Um, and so I guess that's true as well. Uh, it, 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 a star, when it's switching on, is uh, basically going to be just an infrared object because it's getting hot. Uh, mm. And um, it, it eventually, I'm not saying it's that length of time that it takes for the light to come from the center. I think it will be a much more gradual process than that. Uh, but you'll you'll start to see it brightening up as as the process continues. Okay, so during its infrared phase, you wouldn't see it. Uh, you do in the infrared. That's why the Webb telescope is so important. Um, yeah, but with the naked but, eye. No, not, not that you should be looking at no, the sun. No, no that's right. <laughs> but, yeah, um, so he's right. You, would, you wouldn't you would see it in its early no. life until it started emitting bits yeah, of light. Exactly. And then yeah, exactly. Way it goes. Yeah, fascinating. Great questions, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, we're going to continue our look at light. But as I said, don't look directly at the sun. Uh, this is uh, Jared. Hi, Professor Fred and Dave. Our sun puts out radiation across a wide spectrum, gamma rays, X-rays, UV, visible light, infrared, and radio waves. Fred's previously mentioned that the light of the early universe is now stretched and red shifted into the cosmic microwave background. What should we expect from other early universe radiation? Will the sky light up one day with visible light that used to be x-rays 13 billion years ago? Keep up the good work. Love the show. Jared from Melbania. Uh, thank you, Jared. I, I think he's been listening to an old episode where I got ca called Dave quite a few yeah, times. Yeah, we did have the Dave era for some reason <laughs> or another, and it's it's back. Oh, no. It's a good name, <laughs> though, Dave. I quite like it. And my best mate's name is yeah, Dave. Mine, uh, only two best mates who were called Dave. There you are. Um, it's like three. It's a very honest name. <laughs> it's a good honest name. Mm. Um, uh, so yes, so in a way, um, that that visible light is is already there, but it's so weak uh, that we don't see it. So so what we're talking about with the radiation of the early universe 
is a, what's called a black body spectrum. And this is a, you know, like a, it's a, a humped curve. It's a bit like a camel's back. Uh, and you're looking with one end, you've got very short wavelength radiation. The other end, you've got long wave radiation. And the two ends are, uh, they, they slope towards zero gently. So I don't know whether I'm explaining this well. Uh, you really need to diagram. But this black body spectrum, uh, which is well understood, and the cosmic microwave background radiation follows that completely, has its peak in the microwave region of the spectrum, uh, at, corresponding to a temperature of 2.3 degrees, I think is the correct one. Um, so it peaks in the microwave region, but on either side of that, it stretches downwards, uh, approaching zero uh, in the long wavelength region where you're talking about radio waves and in the short wavelength region. Um, I don't know that anybody has ever detected the visible light component of the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's effectively gone to zero because that's the right. characteristic of a black body spectrum. Uh, but what it means is that um, those X-rays, and which I'm sure would have been emitted in the early universe, I don't know the details of that, but I think that the short wavelength uh, tail of the black body spectrum would, would reach uh, down below X radiation. But that's already been redshifted out to the short wavelength end of the existing microwave black body spectrum. If you think of this camel's hump shaped diagram and, and move it to the right uh, in the long wavelength direction by the expansion of the universe, that's effectively what we're talking about. Okay. So... Uh, the sudden burst of light theory that um, Jared mentioned, not likely. Um, it's it's no. happened already. So it's yeah. all over. It, right. So you, you would have seen that um, if you've been you know, observing the universe at a much earlier phase than we are now. It's all been okay. so you, stretched. You missed it, Jared. You missed it. Not, not by no, much. It's only about 13 and a half billion, maybe something, maybe 13 billion years, something. Yeah. Darn it. <laughs> Oh, well, um, good question. Better luck next, better luck next time. <laughs> yes. But it is, it's, we'll a great, it is, it's a great question. Yeah. We'll check it out in the next universe. Yes. <laughs> uh, after the Ganab Gib. Ganab Gib, that's right. Mm. All right. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, everybody who sent in questions. Don't forget, if you would like to send us some questions or just some comments or recipes, whatever you like, uh, you can do that too um, by going to our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io and click on the link. There's the AMA link at the top where you can send text and audio questions or on the right-hand side, send us your audio question, I think it says. Uh, just press that. As long as you've got a device with a microphone, you're all set. And don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from so that we can laugh at you no so that we can uh, identify you we like to know who we're talking to uh, and uh, while you're on our website uh, check it out uh, have a look around check out the shop uh, if you're interested in becoming a patron uh, we have many of those and they are greatly appreciated we would never force you to uh, uh, pay for the podcast but people do it voluntarily and we are so appreciative of that and there are many options uh, if you want to just uh, buy us a cup of coffee as a one-off or if you want to make a regular monthly contribution, totally up to you. You can do that via our website. So um, yeah, check out the supporter link or whatever the heck it's called. I can't remember now. I was only there like two years ago, so I should remember. Um, <laughs> dear, oh dear. Uh, anyway, uh, your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Fred, that wraps it up for another week. Thank you as always. It's a pleasure, Andrew. Um, just... Um... Remember to watch out for those fish and chips as well when you're... Yeah, the fish and chips. Yes, they are. Um, yeah. Once you eat one of those, you'll never eat again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unless you're a radioactive right. alien. Well, that could, yeah. that could help. Mm. All right. Thanks, Fred. We'll see you soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Andrew. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts. And uh, Fred, uh, Fred uh, Hugh couldn't join us to um, make everything work today, which is why everything worked. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for joining us. Look forward to your company on the next episode of Space Nuts.
Bye bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.